The coast of southern Australia is one of the most inhospitable in the world. Lashed by storms that roll unchecked all the way from the Antarctic ice cap across the barren southern ocean to beat themselves against the rampart cliffs of the continent. Cut off by sea from the rest of the planet, the land creatures of Australia have evolved in a totally different way to those elsewhere. And off the shores of this island continent, the undersea world is equally fascinating. Around its cooler and rugged southern coastline, there are many hidden secrets, and species of sea creatures that are found nowhere else. Because just as on the land, life under the ocean surface has evolved in its own unique and little known way. Washed up on a beach, these egg cases are a clue to the whereabouts of one of Australia's weirdest sharks. Every year in July, which is the depth of winter in the Southern Hemisphere, Port Jackson sharks travel many hundreds of kilometres to gather in huge numbers in the shallow coastal waters of Southern Australia. It's the long distance traveller of Australian sharks and it has just one purpose in mind, to find a mate. One of the most unusual sharks, the Port Jackson's skin is made up of tiny denticles that give it a rough texture. Spines in front of its fins give added protection from larger sharks that range in these southern oceans. Actively hunting for food, they scour the sea floor, rummaging for urchins, starfish, mollusks and crustaceans. Most people's preconceptions of sharks is that they all have viciously sharp teeth, but that's far from the truth. The Port Jackson's powerful jaw is adapted not to tearing and ripping the flesh of other creatures, but rather to crushing and grinding its prey. Gulping mouthfuls of sand, they filter it through their gills to sieve out from it anything edible. Sometimes feeding can become a frenzy as more and more Port Jacksons pile into an area where food has been found. Most species of sharks have to keep swimming in order to maintain the flow of water over their gills to breathe. However, Port Jacksons don't need to do this as they are able to lie on the seabed and pump sufficient water through their gills to enable them to breathe without continuously being on the move. But the main reason they're here is to mate. What appears from a distance to be a dead shark on the seafloor is in fact two sharks in the throes of what for Port Jacksons is the height of passion, locked together in mating. And it's another reason why their skin needs to be so tough. This shark still bears the marks of a previous mating encounter. By late in the southern winter, the female will deposit individual egg cases deep in the rocks, often returning to the same nesting sites year after year. It's a uniquely shaped, hard spiral egg case, and it will be between 9 to 12 months before a perfectly formed baby Port Jackson emerges from it. But in these storm-lashed waters, many become dislodged and end up washed up on the shoreline. And it may be that the egg cases face danger too from an unexpected source, from their own species. This Port Jackson, sucking the contents from an egg case, is behaviour that has never before been observed or filmed an unexplained mystery of these southern shores.
Even though these sharks are relatively common along this coast, we still have a lot to learn about their secret lives. Mention the underwater world of Australia to anyone and they'll immediately think of the Great Barrier Reef, the giant coral structure running for 2,000 kilometres off the northeast coast of the continent. But this vast land has many other environments and it's the colder waters of its southern shores that hold the most secrets. It's a coastline that's several thousand kilometers long, with a landscape that epitomizes the image of the dry, sun-baked, wide open spaces of the outback. Australia is a huge, isolated island continent, almost the size of the whole of mainland Europe. So it's hardly surprising that land animals here have evolved very differently to the rest of the world. However, what's far more surprising is that in the cooler and little-known oceanic waters off the south of the continent, the sea life has also developed in isolation, with a large proportion of the species found here being unique to these seas and found nowhere else on the planet. Octopus are members of a larger grouping of sea creatures, known to science as cephalopods, a combination of two Greek words that together mean head-footed, because all their limbs come directly off their head. Cuttlefish and squid are also members of this family, which contains some of the most complex, diverse and fascinating creatures on Earth. They're among the oldest species in our planet's oceans. Even before dinosaurs roamed the land, and millions of years before fish evolved, fossil records show that the oceans teemed with swarming cephalopods. The seas of southern Australia are home to a wide variety of these ancient beings, including some of the strangest members of the cephalopod family. Their eyesight is among the most highly developed of any sea creature, as they rely on their heightened sense of vision to hunt and to spot predators. Their eyes have also evolved to enable them to see in the dark night sea, when many of them emerge to hunt. Within their skins are thousands of tiny, ink-filled sacs called chromatophores, which enable them to rapidly change their colour and appearance. These colour changes can signify alarm, differing moods, can be used for camouflage, mimicry, and for communication with others of the same species. All are carnivorous feeding on other fish and on mollusks, and all are voracious predators, shooting out their feeding tentacles with lightning-fast speed to grab their prey, which is then drawn back to their sharp, hard beaks to be chewed before swallowing. Others simply envelop their prey, though on this occasion the hermit crab survives, with a little help from its mate. Easy prey to many fishes, they have evolved different modes of survival. Many are nocturnal hunters, hiding in crevices and under rocks during the day. Others, like these tiny bobtail squid, simply dig into the sea floor for safety, 
using their fins and jets of water to dig themselves in. This appropriately named pyjama squid is found nowhere else but the southern Australian ocean. Little, round-bodied squid, they spend the day buried, emerging only at night to feed. Some lay eggs in large clutches that they attach to a fixed object on the seabed. Others carry their eggs on their bodies until they hatch. The blue ring octopus is an exception among cephalopods, as it is deadly poisonous to predators. Its iridescent blue rings warning potential attackers of its lethal venom. Few other octopus are poisonous, and they have to rely on colour change and camouflage for their protection. Or, if danger threatens, they can simply sink into the sand. Like subsea meadows, vast swathes of seagrass carpet large areas of the seabed of southern Australia. Sea creatures have evolved to live in these highly specialised environments and are totally different to those found on the open ocean floor. To blend in with the seagrass, firstly, shape is important, so that the fish appears to be just another strand of vegetation. Secondly, pattern is essential. It's only when this clingfish moves that it becomes apparent that the fish is not just another strand of grass. The closer you investigate the seagrass, the more secrets are found hidden there. Probably even now, many pairs of perfectly hidden eyes are peering cautiously back at the camera, totally unseen among their environment. Appearing like a brown stalk of grass makes this pipefish almost invisible in its environment. The final element of survival in the seagrass is colour. Some fish have become so specialised and so localised to just one type of vegetation that their colour is an absolutely perfect match to their surroundings. This pygmy leather jacket looks like just another leaf of seaweed, so exact is the colour match. Because camouflage is essential to escape from the predators that roam in from the open seabed to hunt in the vast seagrass plains. Very different creatures have evolved to live in these specialised environments. Cramps don't have the ability to change colour, and the hard, sharp outline of their shell would make them stand out among the soft contours of the seafloor vegetation making them easy pickings for predators. So, they pluck grass and weed from their surroundings and adorn themselves with it so that they can blend in. The crab shell is covered with tiny, hook-like hairs, almost like Velcro, which holds this camouflage in place. This baby Port Jackson shark has only just hatched from its egg case. 
like juvenile fish of many species. It seeks the protection offered by the seagrass, which is essential if it is to survive to grow to maturity. The rich profusion of life in the Southern Ocean supports large colonies of seals, and the rocky coastline, sparsely inhabited by humans, is the ideal terrain for them to live and breed. In the early 19th century, hunters for seal pelts drove this species to the edge of extinction. Today, seals are protected in these waters, and their numbers are increasing. Some estimates place the population as high as 25,000. That successful recovery has brought its own problems. Some blame them for falling commercial fish catches, and many fishermen would like to see their protection removed. On land, seals are ungainly clumsy and slow moving. Underwater, they're transformed into sleek and graceful dancers. They need every ounce of speed and agility they can muster underwater to evade their main enemy, the Great White Shark. Shark watching has become big business off the coast of Southern Australia Divers travelling from all round the world for the chance of a face-to-face -face encounter with the ocean's apex predator, the Great White. The shark are drawn in by chumming the water with fish blood and guts. You don't get much closer to a Great White Shark than this. Most of the pictures and films that you see of these ultimate hunters will have been taken from shark cages like this one. The Great White may be the main attraction for shark watchers, but another equally fascinating species of shark is found in these waters, which bites more people a year than Great Whites. First named by the Aborigines, the Wobbegong's camouflage helps it to blend in with its reef home. Even the tasseled flaps of skin around its mouth breaking up its outline. Because they're so well hidden, Wobbegongs actually bite more people than any other shark in Australian waters. Though usually their bite is defensive rather than aggressive, often because a diver accidentally disturbs or touches one without even seeing it. It's not the most vicious of bites, 
and it's rarely life-threatening, as wobbegongs tend to lock onto their prey rather than slash and cut. Wobbegongs, like most shark species, are slow-growing, slow to mature, and have relatively few young. With a recently established fishery targeting them to meet the demand from the fish and chip trade, there's been a marked decline in the numbers of this once common and typically Australian shark. But the strangest of all sharks is the saw shark. And this creature is found nowhere else than off the southern Australian coast. Very little is known about this bizarre and secretive shark. It's generally found only in deep water, and usually only encountered when trawled up in fishing nets. A bottom feeding shark, it feeds by digging small fish and crabs from the seabed, sensing the prey with the sensitive barbels hanging from its snout, and using the saw-like extension to dig them out, and then strike and slash at them before eating them. Another shark has adopted perhaps the most unusual of hunting techniques. It lies in hiding and then ambushes its prey. Is this just a ridge on the seafloor? A small school of scad, oblivious to danger. A watcher in the sand. deadly strike from one of the ocean's best hidden predators. Here it is again, frame by frame. The figures are hundredths of a second. The actual strike takes just two camera frames, just eight hundredths of a second. Within 0.2 of a second, the shark has caught the fish and is already dragging it down. And in less than two seconds, the fish has totally disappeared. The angel shark's technique is completely different to the foraging of the Port Jackson, though they share the same living space. It's a perfect ambush predator, motionless, and concealed until it strikes. The sheer size and scale of Australia is astonishing, seemingly endless, stretching as far as the eye can see. While roads now link the vast open spaces of the southern Australian outback, this hasn't always been so. Before the arrival of the roads, wheat and wool, the staple cash crops of the region, 
could only be shipped by sea to the cities. And so, in the late 19th century, jetties sprang up along this stretch of inhospitable coastline. Disused now, many have fallen into disrepair. Others have been preserved. A small number are still in use. All have become landmark features of this coastline. And for the creatures of the sea, they have provided a new living space, a place of safety from the open ocean. The pilings themselves have provided a surface for anemones, sponges and ascidians, every inch being coated with their bright coloured coverings. And they, in their own turn, offer a sanctuary to fish that have evolved to match perfectly their colours. Old industrial structures of steel and wood have become festooned with colour. and other creatures that live under the jetties have their own coats for protection. Decorator crabs have evolved an individual and unique style of camouflage. Plucking parts of anemones and sponges, they attach them to their bodies, softening the contours and helping them to blend in with their surroundings. If in areas of weed, then that is plucked as their chosen camouflage attire. Frogfish go one better than decorator crabs. They actually grow filaments on their bodies and remaining motionless, merge into the background. It's only when they move that the frogfish becomes visible and is at risk from predators. Even the best of camouflage may not prove to be enough. A group of fish pick over the carcass of an unlucky crab. The slugs of the sea are called nudibranchs and they come in a rainbowed array of colours and shapes. Nudibranchs lay thousands of eggs, attaching them to a rock or some other solid object on the seafloor. These pygmy leather jackets are feasting on a freshly laid egg cluster. No matter how sharp and numerous your spines, no matter how seemingly impenetrable your defences may be, there is always someone who can break through them. Few would take on a spiny sea urchin, but the spines are no problem for the tough mouth of the blue grouper.
other strange creatures of the Southern Ocean shallows also make their homes below the man-made structures. Much of the ocean floor is just flat sand, offering little shelter, and few creatures live there. It's where the sea meets the land, where rocky reefs and islets occur, that there are the greatest concentrations of life. These outcrops and reefs offer shelter and protection, a surface on which weed and sponges can grow. Inevitably, such profusions of life attract predators and the whole food chain lives in a fragile balance. Man-made structures in the sea, whether accidental such as shipwrecks or deliberate such as jetties, provide welcome additional living space and rapidly become colonised, an artificial environment which quickly becomes a complete undersea community. This undersea battle lasted for two days, and each time we returned to this particular spot under a jetty to film, the fight was still continuing. To human eyes, there seemed no good reason for the crabs to slug it out for so long. Why didn't one simply retreat, or move on to a more peaceful spot on the seabed? To soft-bodied crabs like the hermit crab, the empty shell of a sea snail is the secret to survival. As they outgrow their temporary homes, finding a larger one becomes essential. Maybe this was a contest to determine which crab would move into a larger shell and so gain its protection. Have you ever walked along the city street at night, looking over your shoulder, feeling that someone's watching you, following you, maybe going to mug you? Well, there are also villains in the nocturnal sea. Carrier crabs are creatures of the night. They cut lumps of living sponge to use as both a shield and as camouflage. So valuable is this protection that they will even resort to mugging other crabs for a choice piece. When this crab spots another with a coat of sponge that he fancies himself, he starts to pull it from the back of a small arrival. When he separates the sponge from its previous owner, he takes it for himself to wear. Adjusting the fit of the sponge with his back legs, the victor leaves the scene of the crime with his spoils. A perfect fit.
Seahorses are big business. Whether for souvenirs or to meet the insatiable demand from the traditional Chinese medicine trade, the market is ever increasing. If taken from the wild, the species would become extinct in no time at all. So in Australia, in a proactive move to protect the population in the wild, seahorse farms are now in business to supply the seahorse trade. This factory specialises in breeding for the aquarium trade and seahorses from here may be exported to collectors around the world. Pregnant seahorses give birth to huge numbers of perfectly formed live young, which are then separated from the parent and raised here until large enough to either join the breeding stock or to be sold. But in the wild, not only is this southern ocean a haven for seahorses, but also for their close relatives, the weedy and leafy sea dragons, the most treasured secret of these seas. The leafy sea dragon is perhaps the most spectacularly camouflaged fish in the ocean. Its leafy appendages are there for just one purpose, to make them invisible against their environment. and both leafy and weedy sea dragons are only found in one area of the ocean, in the cool waters of the southern Australian coast. This is one of the most ancient creatures in the world's oceans. It's also one of the sea's most voracious predators. They hunt by day, and little is safe from their lethal strike.
and of all the cuttlefish found in the world's seas, growing to over a meter in length, the giant Australian cuttlefish is the biggest. Once a year, they congregate in their thousands in a very small area off the southern Australian coast. Moving in from deep water to shallow reefs only a couple of meters deep, where they engage in a frenzy of mating. It's an ancient and stylized ritual. The pulsating patterns of the larger male have two purposes. They serve both to attract females and to warn off potential rivals in this mating free-for-all. To woo the female, the male shows his finest display. If she's receptive, then they couple face to face. Locked together, the male passes sperm-filled packets to a pouch under the female's mouth. She then starts to lay her eggs, concealing them individually and carefully in crevices and under rocks on the seabed, passing them each in turn over the male's sperm package in order to fertilize them. But it's at this stage that there's trouble. Rival males attempt to replace the sperm with their own, so the male must stand guard over the female while she lays her eggs. It's an example of the principle of natural selection and survival of the species. The strongest will fertilize the eggs, passing on his genes to the next generation. In the frenzy, there can be many rivals attempting to get to the female as she lays. Competition's fierce, and in the free-for-all, competing males can mob a single available female. flaring his arms out to their full length to make himself appear at his largest and with colours pulsating their electronic signals the male squares up to his rival both rolling onto their sides to maximise the impact of their display the speed and intensity of the signals varying with the message and emotion that the cuttlefish is transmitting often the posturing alone is enough to chase off a weaker or smaller rival but if two evenly matched males square up, a fight can develop, and many bear breeding scars from the bites and suckers of their rivals. While the male's attentions are distracted by one rival, others seize the opportunity to sneak in to the momentarily unguarded female. Once the eggs are laid, the interest of both male and female ends, and the eggs are left alone to hatch. Mating is the culmination of the life of the cuttlefish, and after the mating aggregation, the cuttlefish return to the open ocean. The lifespan of the giant cuttlefish is just a couple of years, and they see just one mating aggregation in their short lives. Wherever fishermen anchor up to clean their catch, there is always the chance of a free meal. Stingrays have learnt this lesson over time, and they thrive around the fishing harbours scattered along the coast. In this southern Australian bay, smooth rays spend their days cruising the harbour shallows in search of scraps. 
It's very unusual to see eagle rays in shallow water. They're usually fish of the open ocean. But they have also learned of the chance of free food and are from time to time also spotted here in the shallow waters of harbors. Rays and shark are all part of the same family of fishes, known to scientists as elasmobranchs. And the seafloor of southern Australia is home to many unusual rays. There are about 50 different species of rays in Australian waters. Much of their lives are spent hidden under the sand, only their eyes protruding. mouths are on the underside of their flattened bodies, and they feed on crabs and fish buried in the sand. But there are other rays that have a far more sinister hunting technique. The num ray has a very unique method of taking its prey. 220 volts, a severe electrical shock. The same as the jolt you'd get from your home electrical system. If you know what that feels like to a fully grown human being, then try and imagine the effect on a fish. shock is more than enough to stun and probably kill a fish, giving the ray all the time it needs to eat it. And the num ray is capable of repeating that charge as many as 50 times in just 10 minutes. The speed of the strike is faster than the eye can see as the ray spits out a fish stunned and juddering from the voltage coursing through its body. But why let the fish escape? Let's rewind the tape and watch it again. It's only when the shot is replayed in slow motion that the answer becomes apparent. In a lightning fast movement, the ray envelops not one, two fish. And even this creature of nightmares can only consume one fish at a time. There are many surprising, often beautiful, sometimes shocking secrets hidden beneath the seas of southern Australia.
By late in the southern winter, the female will deposit individual egg cases deep in the rocks, often returning to the same nesting sites year after year. It's a uniquely shaped, hard spiral egg case, and it will be between 9 to 12 months before a perfectly formed baby Port Jackson emerges from it. But in these storm-lashed waters, many become dislodged and end up washed up on the shoreline. And it may be that the egg cases face danger too from an unexpected source, from their own species. This Port Jackson, sucking the contents from an egg case, is behaviour that has never before been observed or filmed an unexplained mystery of these southern shores. Even though these sharks are relatively common along this coast, we still have a lot to learn about their secret lives. Mention the underwater world of Australia to anyone and they'll immediately think of the Great Barrier Reef, the giant coral structure running for 2,000 kilometres off the northeast coast of the continent. But this vast land has many other environments, just with one purpose in mind, to find a mate. One of the most unusual sharks, the Port Jackson's skin is made up of tiny denticles that give it a rough texture. Spines in front of its fins give added protection from larger sharks that range in these southern oceans. Actively hunting for food, they scour the sea floor, rummaging for urchins, starfish, mollusks and crustaceans. Most people's preconceptions of sharks is that they all have viciously sharp teeth, but that's far from the truth. The Port Jackson's powerful jaw is adapted not to tearing and ripping the flesh of other creatures, but rather to crushing and grinding its prey. Gulping mouthfuls of sand, they filter it through their gills to sieve out from it anything edible. Sometimes feeding can become a frenzy as more and more Port Jacksons pile into an area where food has been found. Most species of sharks have to keep swimming in order to maintain the flow of water over their gills to breathe. However, Port Jacksons don't need to do this as they are able to lie on the seabed and pump sufficient water through their gills to enable them to breathe without continuously being on the move. But the main reason they're here is to mate. What appears from a distance to be a dead shark on the seafloor is in fact two sharks in the throes of what for Port Jacksons is the height of passion, locked together in mating. And it's another reason why their skin needs to be so tough. This shark still bears the marks of a previous mating encounter. The coast of southern Australia is one of the most inhospitable in the world. Lashed by storms that roll unchecked all the way from the Antarctic ice cap across the barren southern ocean to beat themselves against the rampart cliffs of the continent. Cut off by sea from the rest of the planet, the land creatures of Australia have evolved in a totally different way to those elsewhere. And off the shores of this island continent, the undersea world is equally fascinating. 
Around its cooler and rugged southern coastline, there are many hidden secrets, and species of sea creatures that are found nowhere else. Because just as on the land, life under the ocean surface has evolved in its own unique and little known way. Washed up on a beach, these egg cases are a clue to the whereabouts of one of Australia's weirdest sharks. Every year in July, which is the depth of winter in the Southern Hemisphere, Port Jackson sharks travel many hundreds of kilometres to gather in huge numbers in the shallow coastal waters of Southern Australia. It's the long distance traveller of Australian sharks and it has the oceans teemed with swarming cephalopods. The seas of southern Australia are home to a wide variety of these ancient beings, including some of the strangest members of the cephalopod family. Their eyesight is among the most highly developed of any sea creature, as they rely on their heightened sense of vision to hunt and to spot predators. Their eyes have also evolved to enable them to see in the dark night sea, when many of them emerge to hunt. Within their skins are thousands of tiny, ink-filled sacs called chromatophores, which enable them to rapidly change their colour and appearance. These colour changes can signify alarm, differing moods, can be used for camouflage, mimicry, and for communication with others of the same species. All are carnivorous, feeding on other fish and on mollusks, and all are voracious predators, shooting out their feeding tentacles with lightning-fast speed to grab their prey which is then drawn back to their sharp, hard beaks to be chewed before swallowing. Others simply envelop their prey, though on this occasion the hermit crab survives, with a little help from its mate. Easy prey to many fishes, they have evolved different modes of survival. Many are nocturnal hunters, hiding in crevices and under rocks during the day. Others, like these tiny bobtailed squid, simply dig into the sea floor and it's the colder waters of its southern shores that hold the most secrets. It's a coastline that's several thousand kilometers long with a landscape that epitomises the image of the dry, sun-baked, wide-open spaces of the outback. Australia is a huge, isolated island continent, almost the size of the whole of mainland Europe, so it's hardly surprising that land animals here have evolved very differently to the rest of the world. However, what's far more surprising is that in the cooler and little-known oceanic waters off the south of the continent, the sea life has also developed in isolation, with a large proportion of the species found here being unique to these seas and found nowhere else on the planet. Octopus are members of a larger grouping of sea creatures, known to science as cephalopods, a combination of two Greek words that together mean head-footed, because all their limbs come directly off their head. Cuttlefish and squid are also members of this family, which contains some of the most complex, diverse and fascinating creatures on Earth. They're among the 
oldest species in our planet's oceans. Even before dinosaurs roamed the land, and millions of years before fish evolved, fossil records show 